Well, hello. My name is Jesse Peterson. I am with Lush Life Productions, and I'm hanging out today with Tyler Rothenberg, who's part of the global, the elite global team. Tyler is here with the first class of a two-part series designed to help you craft the perfect freeze martini. And that's just in time for a PDXCW Portland Cocktail Week presents Elite Masters. Tyler is going to hang out and explain the freeze filtration technique that makes Elite the perfect base for a freeze martini. We're also going to talk about exploring freezing techniques and methods to help develop creative cocktail experiences with Elite. He's going to cover everything from temperature control, dilution management, ice, really, really cool subjects. But please make sure you're dropping your cold, hard questions in the chat. There is a couple things I want to cover before I let Tyler take it away here. Um, first, so please like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel, PDXCW. Follow us on Instagram, also at PDXCW. And then don't forget to submit your Elite Freeze Martinis at pdxcw.com slash Elite Masters. And to take it away, here's Tyler. Thanks, Jesse. I appreciate that. So good to be here and to have an opportunity to get in front of you all and share what I believe to be some really cool, fun, creative techniques behind the bar. Before I get into that, I'll quickly introduce myself. I'm getting Tyler Rothenberg. I work for the Elite Vodka Global Brand Team as part of the Stoli Group. But before I got into the brand side of the business, I bartended for about 10 years um, and you know, kind of worked my way through different avenues, really seeking to understand how to not only build the best cocktail, but how to share the experience of the cocktail with my guest. And that's exactly what I hope um, to impart by the end of this. I had an opportunity to get to meet everyone on the Lush Life team and become a part of this family and community in 2018 when I went to Camp Runamuck. And then again in 2019 when I had an opportunity to go back in a leadership role um, I've also been involved with Portland Cocktail Week, and I really know firsthand um, how special this team is and their ability to truly advocate for bartenders and to provide bartenders with the most incredible platforms to grow as both human beings and as professionals. So we're really excited to have partnered up with Lush Life um, to present Elite Masters. And then I've been on the brand side of the business in some capacity for about seven years or so now, doing everything from distillation, distribution, ambassador work, and now brand management. Um, and I really hope to have an opportunity to combine my experience and uh, give you a few, few tools to throw in the old tool, ba tool bag. But uh, that's enough about me. Um, so we're going to go ahead and throw this presentation up and get going. So as Jesse pointed out, Oh, we're here because we want to talk about the martini, right? But what we really want to accomplish is have an opportunity to share why Elite Vodka helps you, the bartender, create the best martini and then provide you with a few very specific techniques that will enhance your ability to create the freeze martini and hopefully submit it to Elite Masters and have an opportunity to go to Athens, Greece at the end of the year. Um, as we are sending 10 bartenders from the U.S. to complete in the global finals in the beginning of November, just in time for Athens Bar Show. Uh, but we'll go to the next slide and give you a little bit of background of who we are as a brand. So Elite was originally created in 2003 and it's a pretty simple mission, right? It's a, simple, I suppose, could be complex, but we'll keep that word. Simple mission. That mission is to produce the absolutely best vodka we possibly could. And thinking about the vodka from each touch point, from the mouthfeel to the nose, to the flavor profiles, to the finish, and quite frankly, trying to break the mold and understanding that definition of vodka is neutral, colorless, flavorless, odorless, right? And showing the world that vodka does have beautiful nuanced flavors and very unique attributes and characteristics that can set it apart. And so for us to be able to accomplish that, we had to think about each step of the production process. 
We had to think about our grain, which is going to be a combination of spring and winter wheat from the black band. And this area is known as being the most fertile land really on the planet. It grows tremendous, tremendous grain that we have an opportunity to utilize. When we look at our mineral rich waters, we have a 200 meter artisan well that we're able to ensure the highest quality of vodka possible going into this spirit. The freeze filtration processes, which is what we're really going to dive into here in a bit, allow us to concentrate the vodka, really focusing in on the purities, ensuring a beautifully rounded, viscous vodka that's great for sipping and especially great for making a martini. And all of those elements have allowed us the opportunity to win 12 platinum awards, um, which is the highest of any white spirit. And we're extremely, extremely proud of that. So now we're going to move on and kind of start getting into what the martini is. And, you know, normally when I'm in person, I like to be extremely interactive. So let's not take the computer screen away from us accomplishing that. There are going to be questions that I'll ask, and please feel free to chime in and submit your answers. Um, and we love to really you know, make this a collaborative effort and ensure that we're um, answering everybody's questions and making this a fun conversation. So the question, right, and, and if you want to answer this now, please go for it. But really, it's something to sit on right now is how can freezing techniques make your martini better? Right? But what I really want to ask is what makes the perfect martini? Now I really want one. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> so while we're waiting for some questions, I'll kind of, you know, uh, I'll start the conversation or hopefully um, answer what I believe and what I've heard a lot in the back in the past. Uh, so dilution just came through. Thank you, Chris. Absolutely. 1000% dilution. Um, another one I saw as I was asking the question is ice cubes, right? So ice. The thing that I find to be so fascinating about the martini is if I were to ask the question to an audience, which I've done many, many times, what is a martini? You're going to get all types of different questions. Oh, it has vodka, it has gin, it has this much vermouth, it has no vermouth at all, it has olive juice, it doesn't have olive juice, it's shaken, it's stirred, it's up, it's on the rocks, it has a twist, it gets an olive, whatever it may be, right? And to that person, that is the martini. But what we all can agree upon is in order to really enjoy the martini experience, it has to be at the right temperature and it has to have the right dilution amount, right? A warm martini, no good. A martini that's super cold, but that's over diluted, no good. So if we can really focus and understand how to manage those two elements, then we can ensure that we control a consistent martini experience all the time. And Josh Seberg, absolutely, brother. So texture is huge and nuance, right? So texture, the mouthfeel, the velvety uh, profiles that really fill the palate um, and the drinking experience from the moment it touches the tip of your tongue until that final swallow, right? And viscosity is a great word, I think, to, to use to help um, kind of sum that up. And we're going to talk about that. But really what our key learning outcomes will be here is the history of freezing techniques in alcohol production. So where do freezing techniques start? Where do they you know, come from? How have they advanced? Why are they important? Um, and specifically how we utilize some of these techniques to produce our vodka. We're going to talk about how temperature impacts flavor and mouthfeel. Um, and I'm going to go into this in more detail here in a bit, but I, I really want to get you all thinking about this because it's one of my favorite exercises I've ever done. And that's tasting spirit, specifically vodka, in this case, elite vodka at different temperatures. So a really easy way to accomplish this is room temperature, 
refrigerated and frozen, right, from the freezer. I'm not going to ruin any surprises now because, again, I'm diving into this, but just keep that in mind and, you know, really start thinking about bringing this to life at home. Controlling the temperature to elevate your martini, right? So just not what the temperature needs to be or should be, but different techniques that allow you to ensure consistency in this temperature from not only the way you serve it, but potentially the way you store it and other techniques that you can utilize to create both flavor, mouthfeel, texture, um, you know, a show, all of these elements. And then where we're kind of going with the future of freeze techniques. And there's some pretty neat ones on here that I'll get to uh, dive into. Uh, so let's keep this going to the next slide. So I wanted to just quickly shout out um, some of the key contributors uh, to this presentation. Jack Sodi, um, he works on behalf of Elite Vodka, a really incredible bartender from the UK, uh, has tons of experience in the competition circuit and is now really uh, utilizing his travel and his perspective to help shape um, you know, cocktail culture and, and to help support uh, bartending community with tools and techniques to enhance your own uh, pathways behind the bar. Uh, Lion McPherson, so he owns an incredible establishment in Panda and Sons, uh, Hoot the Redeemer and the Nauticus, all in Edinburgh. And he's extremely, extremely passionate about freezing techniques. And a lot of where this material comes from is going to be inspired um, and directly contributed to Jan. And so we're, we're thankful uh, for having his expertise in here. Um, and then Ginta, who is our master blender and head of our laboratory in Elite. And she really dedicates her entire life into ensuring that she understands not only how to produce uh, the world's best vodka, but she is constantly pushing the limits in what her production methods are and also ensuring consistency and quality in everything that she does. So we're extremely lucky to have her on our team. So now we're going to get into freeze distillation and some of the specific origins. So as you can tell, right, early 500s, I'm not a mathematician, but that was a long, long time ago. And where it started is in Central Asia, where the Mongolians, they would create this fermented dairy product made from milk, and they would concentrate that down by freezing it. And that freezing technique would allow the alcohol percentage to strengthen and to grow. And in the late 1300s is really when we started noticing freeze filtration. And how this would work is in order to quickly cool the vodka, ice was added to vodka after distillation and the oils would be condensed and then removed, right? And so the oils um, really contributed to a very unique and specific mouthfeel. And then in 1500s in Northern Europe, uh, they would leave all of their vodka cast out um, into these really, really, really cold temperatures. And what they learned is as it sat over time that the flavor profiles and the spirit would actually mellow, um, which would make it more approachable, uh, which, of course, you know, to most people is, is preferred. And so that was a method that they started to implement in order to um, really create the, the most sippable product of that time, right, of the 1500s. Um, and now we're going to move on to a few more methods. So a lot of us, I'm sure uh, the next few have heard. Um, so in the 1690s, uh, the process of fruit jacking really begins. And this happens with Lairds. And what they would do is, is really the process of creating apple jack is freezing cider, right? And then once the cider is frozen, removing the ice and concentrating on the, the liquid or the distillate. And then the 1790s, um, the methodology of freezing grapes on a vine um, and then using these frozen grapes to produce wine uh, became very popular in creating ice wine. 
In the 1890s, there was the birth of ice beer. Um, and this was the process of uh, leaving the cask out again. And what would happen is the beer temperatures would drop to fr a below freezing point, And then the water would start to crystallize into slush. Um, and then they would separate, realizing that there was impact to flavor because of this um, slush and the temperature dropping below freezing. And then in the 1960s, with commercialization, businesses started understanding um, that there's a real opportunity to take some of these historically uh, successful methods and utilize modern capacities and capabilities um, that would allow us to chill these liquids, condense fatty acids and proteins that would, again, impact flavor, impact mouthfeel, viscosity, finish, and overall quality of the spirit itself. Hey, and are we on that note, we just had a really quick question from Jasmine. Uh, she wants to know if they use freeze distillation, like fat washing a bourbon, if it's kind of the same process. Yeah, Jasmine, that's a great question. So I'll actually talk about that a little bit in some of the specific techniques. Um, but there's, it's similar from the thought process of and, and you know, fat washing and freezing, separating the fatty acids from the spirit um, in freeze filtration, you, you know, separate the water essentially, but the molecules condense and become much more viscous during this process, which changes the mouthfeel. So there's, you know, different processes, but I think the ideas is certainly similar um, to utilizing the cold to separate um, you know, molecules uh, that really focus in on changing the flavor and the texture of those molecules. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, so now we're really gonna, you know, quickly touch on the freeze filtration process itself. So like all distillates, you know, we go through your standard distillation process, right? mashing, fermentation, distillation, etc. And now that we have, so we're going to start our process of discussing freeze filtration at the point of distillation. And so we've already made the base spirit. Um, now we're going to work on really what most people will consider the proofing process, um, but we're going to call it the blending process as it applies to freeze filtration. So what we're going to do now that we have our alpha spirit distillation and, and really the word alpha is just to communicate the quality that we expect. Um, and it's when it comes to cuts from the heads and the tails, we cut about four times more product than the average vodka distiller does. And really what we're trying to do is focus entirely on the hearts, ensuring that our product before we go into the freeze filtration process is as pure as possible. And when it meets that standard that we've set for it, we then consider it to be our at our alpha spirit uh, distillation. So now we're taking that water that I discussed, uh, extremely mineral rich water that's managed um, by our team that comes from the 200 meter artisan well. So that water is added and then the water is purified. And we then are going to filter the proofed spirit utilizing a quartz sand filtration that's going to continue to help strip any impurities from this vodka, always focusing in on quality control through each step of this process. All right, so then we're going to go to a charcoal filtration, right? So we're actually introducing heat to the product. Um, we're bringing it up to 15 degrees Celsius. So we're warming the product. Going back through our quartz sand filtration process, and this is when we're flash freezing. So what we're doing here is there's a freeze filtration um, and heat exchange, and the temperature is going to rapidly drop from 15 degrees Celsius to negative 18 degrees Celsius, which is about zero degrees in Fahrenheit, utilizing this ion plate freeze. Um, it's a plate uh, that's charged by ions and it quickly, quickly, quickly crash cools. As soon as the product is frozen, 
Um, we're then going to take this and we're going to let it rest for six days. And we are doing nothing to this. It's literally going to be in still vats, large still vats. And we're going to allow the heat of just natural heat to bring this product to temp. So now that it's thawed, essentially, we're going to remove the spirit or really strain the spirit from the, the slush as it is. And what's happened throughout this process is as you introduce the filtration of the quartz sand that's removing additional impurities to incorporating heat and opening up those molecules, right, releasing the molecules to flash freezing down to 18 degrees, which are now tightening those molecules um, and restricting them and concentrating really everything in the vodka to letting it sit for six days and re-releasing. So it's essentially breathing, right? The same way when you think about the process of putting um, spirit or, or, or putting, you know, whiskey, unaged whiskey off the still into barrels and you're allowing the barrels to breathe. Well, this vodka, the molecule, the molecular structure of the vodka is doing the exact same thing. So by the time it's ready to then filter before we put it into the bottle, we've really been able to concentrate the flavor and we've really been able to change the mouthfeel. And that mouthfeel is this really nice, viscous, buttery, soft mouthfeel that's unlike any other vodka I've personally tried. That sounds delicious. Um, we do have a couple of questions if we're at a good space for that. We're yeah. going to go a little nerdy at first. And Darian wants to know if quartz is an inert material and how that functions as a filter substrate. Darren, that's a wonderful question. And I'll be completely honest with you. As someone that doesn't do distillation every day, I'm going to have to find the answer to that question for you. Um, but I'll make sure you have my information and then I'll get, um, I'll talk to Ginta and I'll get you a right answer. I don't want to lead you wrong there. Um, and then Jason wants to know how large the batch is and the amount of time it takes for this process to happen. Yeah, so that's a great question. So the batch really depends upon where we are in the production life cycle and what our you know orders. So we typically produce six months ahead of ordering. Um, so the batch it it, it changes. Um, and what we have to take to account is so we 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 don't what we don't do is just produce a bunch of vodka and then the vodka sits right. So we work globally with our commercial teams. Um, to plan for what our order cycles are going to be. And then as we get those, um, we produce. So we essentially are producing to order. Um, so the batch is completely different. So the length of time it takes to freeze during the flash freeze process, it takes about a no longer, depending upon the size of the batch, it's anywhere from two to six hours. It's a very, very quick process. Um, and then it sits for six days. And then we'll piggyback that with Darian's next question. If it's a six day period um, in an insulated container, I think you just answered that, but it is in an insulated container. Yep. Cool. And then is there any way that we could see this firsthand? If you guys have video, if there's anything on the website, anything like that? Yeah, that's a great question. So that's actually something I'm working on now. Um, so we do all of our distillation in Latvia. And I, you know, I've been with the team for seven months now. Um, and one of the things on my list is getting this exact video process or uh, a video um, taken so we could share it. And this is actually what we're doing right now is the first educational, like public educational component, I think in my understanding at least ever had in one of my passions. Um, and, and honestly, I'm, I'm putting this on myself as a responsibility is to ensure that we're providing clarity um, on all of our processes. And we're really um, opening up the, the door and the blinders, if you will, to see how, you know, not only how everything's made, um, but really providing, you know, anyone that's interested, especially the bartender with direct insights um, and facts um, to really build your trust and confidence, right? So like I come from the bar and it's important to me that I understood everything about the ingredients that I were using. So I'm in the process of trying to bring all this to life right now. Uh, so Darren, hopefully we'll have a uh, video by the end of the year, but I'll, I'll keep in touch with you and um, continue to share resources and assets as I build them out. Amazing. 
Awesome. Well, shall we keep going? Let's do it. All righty. So why I think it's extremely important, you know, to have the conversation about our freeze filtration process. It's not only, it, it's what I don't, what I'm not trying to accomplish, right? And I mean this sincerely is I'm not just trying to say, oh, look at us. We're the best. This is why. What I'm really trying to accomplish is we all agreed that dilution and temperature are critical in the martini, um, are critical in creating and serving the best martini possible. Those are two variables that we all agreed upon. So really what I want to emphasize with our freeze filtration process is the dilution or the water source and type in which we're using and the methodologies of production, including our freeze filtration processes, are most important to producing this vodka, which I believe directly align with the martini and providing you all with the tool you can use to enhance the martini experience because Elite Vodka really, 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 really cares about dilution and temperature. So if... Really quick. No, please come uh -huh. on. Yeah. So a couple of questions coming in from the YouTube as well. Um, Augustina wants to know if we're batching to order and then kind of piggybacking on that, if there's a different, if there's a differentiation between batches or if everything come is the same process. Yeah, for sure. So for the question batching to order, so you're asking, are, are we making product to order, right? We absolutely are. Yeah. So we forecast all of our orders um, and we do that in really three to six month increments, depending. And then we're producing based upon demand. So what we're not doing is just making a bunch of vodka and the vodka is just sitting in the warehouses. Um, we're, we're really ensuring that we understand uh, who our customers are, what their needs are, and then we're meeting those needs. And then as demand grows, then the batches will continue to grow with it. Um, but there is no differentiation between batches. Um, the processes are completely the same. The grain source is completely the same. The freeze filtration is completely the same. The cuts between the tails and the heads are completely the same. Um, the water source used completely the same. Um, so it's, it's really, you know, it's extremely controlled um, and the consistency to us is, is critical. Um, you know, it's, it's not like a whiskey where I think having nuances and flavors from batch to batch or, or from, you know, expression to expression is important when it comes to elite and ensuring consistency and quality of the vodka every time it's of the utmost importance to us. Amazing. Uh, and then another question about, since we're talking about taste and textures, does the taste change over time? Obviously, when we talk about wine, there's a oxidation that happens. So is there a time window where you should be enjoying the vodka once it's opened? Yeah, Tiffany, that's a great question. So um, once the spirit's in the bottle, so I guess this is a kind of double-edged sword. Um, if you were to leave the spirit in the bottle sitting on a shelf, and it, it stayed on that shelf, there would be no change to the flavor profiles, the consistency, texture, mouthfeel, none of that. It would remain exactly the same. However, where change will occur, and we're about to kind of talk about this now, is if there's any impact to temperature. So if you were to take a, you know, your bottle of Elite and you were to put it in the fridge or you were to put it in the freezer or you were to, you know, keep it out, put it in the fridge, take it out, keep it out and continue to change the, the temperature, then there will absolutely be impact to flavor. And I, I mentioned as I first started talking and, you know, if we were in person, we would conduct this, but one day, hopefully I get to share this, um, you know, tasting exercise with all of you. It's one of the most unique things I've ever done. Um, I've done, you know, I used to work in the whiskey business. Um, I've done tastings with Tony Abogadam and, and a few really incredible influencers of the business with vodka specifically. I've done blind tastings of vodka. Um, you know, I've tasted martini side by side. One thing I've never done until very recently is I never tasted the same product at different temperatures side by side. 
And we recently conducted this, and this is a tasting exercise that I, for now on, will always implement. Um, and I really encourage you all to try this on your own. And I really encourage you all to share this because it is so fascinating and it's extremely simple. Just take a bottle of Elite at room temperature, take a bottle of Elite in the fridge, take a bottle of Elite in the freezer. And I, and I would, for greatest impact, I'd recommend, you know, let's say 24 hours of keeping in the fridge and freezer. Let's ensure optimal um, timing uh, to bring the temperature down as much as possible um, and ensuring that the refrigerated bottle and the bottle in the freezer sat for the same amount of time. So we're really controlling the experiment here. But what I will tell you is there is an extreme difference in the nose, the mouthfeel, the flavor profiles on the palate and the finish. Room temp, to refrigerated, there's extreme differences. Refrigerated to freezer, there's extreme differences. And I'm saying, I mean, I, I can't emphasize this enough. Room temperature to freezer, it, it's completely night and day. I mean, completely night and day. It, and it's it's not just the mouthfeel because I think freezing anything, because when you think about the molecular structure, and I want to um, uh, preference, I'm not a scientist by any means. So I'm using this word molecular like I'm a science guy. I'm really, really not. I just know something happens to the molecules and they tighten up. Um, but the molecular structure, because the temperature is changing. So with that, of course, mouthfeel is going to change, but the flavors actually change. Um, and why I think this is important, and I'll talk about it, I, I believe, here in a second, but is really if you're trying to provide your guest or yourself or whoever it is you're making martini for and serving, um, with the best martini experience, and, and a lot of folks, you know, might say there's no flavor in vodka. If you freeze your vodka and you taste your vodka, there's absolutely flavor. I mean, I pulled apple is a big flavor I pulled. Um, there's light citrusy notes, um, you know, the earthy undertones of like lemongrass. Like it, it, it was, I don't want to say flavor bomb because I think that's somewhat exaggerative, but it was certainly had beautiful natural flavor coming from the freezer. So it was really, really neat. Super cool. um, so now, you know, just touching uh, a few of our kind of flavors, uh, going through the tasting profile, um, you know, the nose, uh, you'll certainly find the buttery, lemon peel, green fennel fronds on the palate, sweet rice milk, oat citrus. Um, the texture, I, I continue to say viscous. Um, and I know I use that word a lot, but it is certainly viscous. And the viscosity is directly associated and attributed because of the freeze filtration process. And when we think about building cocktails behind the bar, you have to think about mouthfeel. If you have a flat cocktail, I mean, maybe that's preference of your guests, right? But if you're really serving, in my opinion, serving a martini, the mouthfeel is critical. And it's not only critical from the first sip, but it's as important in the middle of the experience and as you finish that very last drop. So ensuring in the same way that you're thinking about your vermouth choices, you know, selecting your vermouth that not only has beautiful flavor built in, but also has really beautiful, strong mouthfeel is important because you're um, preserving the drinking experience over the entire life of that one cocktail. Um, and, and we really, really, really have to think about that. And, you know, also talking about the technique of mixing your martinis, you know, everyone has a preference, I'm sure. Um, you know, I, I think most people, if you're talking about a gin martini, uh, a lot of people presumably stir. And if you're talking about a vodka martini, what I'm learning is it seems uh, people preferably shake, right? And I think one of the reasons that sh shaking the vodka martini uh, comes into play is because you can really make it cold. But what happens is you have, you know, you're risking dilution and over diluting. Um, and you're also changing the mouthfeel and you're introducing more oxygen into the beverage that it probably needs. Um, and you're really disrupting the molecular structure, which is going to give it a little bit more of a rough mouthfeel. So I would challenge everyone to stir their vodka martini. Um, and using a brand like Elite that has that viscous mouthfeel, you're going to get a similar drinking experience to having like a really beautiful Manhattan um, because it is so velvety the entire um, lifespan of the drink. So I think it's important to keep in mind. 
And then finish, um, you know, you do have a really nice peppery finish. Um, you know, certainly not a rye whiskey, but it, it does, uh, I think it's reminiscent of, of a rye based spirit um, that has sustenance and, and, you know, that friendly reminder of, hey, I'm here, but it's also approachable. Um, and I think, uh, you know, delightful uh, on that last sip. Amazing. Because you did touch on rye just now, can you refresh us on the raw materials that go into Elite? Yeah, absolutely. So the grain is going to be, um, it's single source grain, it's spring and winter wheat, and that's grown in the Black Band. So that's near uh, Latvia in that region of the world. And then obviously, since temperature is the key focus of what we're talking about today, um, Augustina wants to know, how does Elite control the temperature when it comes to distribution? Yeah, that, that is a great question. So um, I think that's, and I'm glad you brought this up because it, it seems like this is a um, challenge that I'm trying to face. And so the, the vodka itself is not cold, right? So we utilize a freeze filtration method that brings the vodka down to negative 18 degrees that allows it to freeze. And then for six days, it sits and it comes back to room temperature. And that helps us manage and create flavor um, and manage and create mouthfeel and viscosity. But the bottle of uh, the vodka itself is bottled at room temperature um, and it's stored and served at room temperature. So it is not, you will not find this vodka cold anywhere, but our recommendation is when you do purchase or use this vodka, um, we find it to be best when it goes back into the freezer. So then every bar should have one of those upside down bottle shot machines. So it's frozen when Darian said elite frozen shot machines. Uh, well, so I am working on I'm, I'm, Yeah, exactly. So I'm actually working Darian and I'm happy, man. You, you and I have to connect, right? So um, I'm happy to show you some renderings uh, of exactly that uh, because I, I, I really do think in, you know, the word shot, I'm going to, take one step back and, and, and use the word tasting, but I do think that elite vodka is, and I'm going to challenge myself and, and I'm challenging my team to create a sippy experience. Um, I honestly, I drink it on the rocks. Like I just drink the vodka and I just drink it on the rocks. Maybe I have a twist, but because I believe at the right temperature and the right dilution, there's so much flavor that it's really, really yummy on its own. Um, and that's not normally how I would ever drink vodka. You know, I, I would absolutely drink whiskey um, on the rocks, even tequila on the rocks, not vodka. But uh, this one's so unique. Yeah. Kind of goes into his next question of how to navigate on premise, you know, how you would serve it at a bar. But I guess on the rocks, just like you said, perfect. Yeah. Let's go. Actually, the next slide, I think. Um, yeah. Let's keep cruising. Kind of talks about. So I'm going to come back to that question, Darren, because I do have I'm going to touch on that. Um, the quick answer that I will tell you is I'm actually in the process of building out tools right now that help bars without freezer capabilities to keep the bottle cold and at temperature. So I really take that as a responsibility of my own and where I am with this um, brand to provide you with tools. My expectation is that you don't go out of your way to keep it cold, but that we give you the tools you need to keep it cold that are easy and accessible to you. Again, I come from the bar for years, so I, I know what a challenge that can be. Um, so that's something I'm currently working on as, as we, as we speak. So, um, so really you want to talk about the Arctic, you know, perfecting the martini. Um, does anyone know the perfect temperature for a martini? Chilled. Yep, for sure. There you go. <laughs> Love it. Um, so the perfect, and this is just based upon all of my research, um, is going to be negative 10 degrees Celsius or 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and with the tools, we're working on creating a tool, a bar spoon that will allow you to stir the cocktail, measure the temperature, um, ensuring consistency and quality control of, of the temperature. Um, but that's what I've learned uh, is, is really what you're trying to get to is right around 14 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is, uh, you know, quite cold. Um, and, you know, talking about some of the ways you can make it colder, uh, freezing your vodka is certainly one of those, you know, of course, chilling your glass 
is is certainly an opportunity. Um, and really just thinking about every sensory touch point. You know, maybe you have a coaster you can serve that's made of ceramic and it's cold. Um, or whatever, you know, serve ice on the side if you like for the your guests, but really thinking about each touch point of cold. And as you go through um, and you think about building your, your freeze martini for elite masters, that's one critical area to think about is how do I share the sensory um, experience of cold? And it's not just through the liquid or the beverage itself. Think about all of the touch points that you use to create this idea of cold, right? From, you know, uh, I mean, sound, right? I think sound, there's certain songs you can hear that I think transport you to cold. Um, visuals, you know, there's certainly visual cues that make people feel cold. Um, you know, the way you dress, you see someone bundled up in jackets, that makes you feel cold. Um of course, the temperature itself, you know, the flavors, are there any flavors that remind you of cold areas and climates? Uh, but you have to really ensure, you know, you're, you're thinking about all of the senses and connecting and tying them all back to cold. Um, does anyone know how much dilution about you want in your cocktail? I'm at a normally 25%, but I don't, I, I don't know. I guess everyone's a little bit different. Yeah, no, that, I mean, that's pretty good. You know, I've, I've, and this is just kind of through my research and experience, 20 to 22% mm -hmm. um, of dilution. I know when I would pre-batch behind mm -hmm. the bar, I keep it about 22%, um, just, just a little more than 20, but yeah, 20% dilution is pretty spot on. Um, you know, that's important to understand too, uh, when it comes to freezer martini. And if you actually go forward, we'll talk about the freezer martini. Um, or actually, I apologize. I don't know my own slides. Um, but when it comes to dilution and controlling um, serves and making sure you're setting yourself up for efficiency, and, and if you are pre-batching and measuring out the dilution, 20%, really good rule of thumb. Um, so the next question, what is the best ice for stirring a martini? If you could go forward, please. Does anybody have any examples of ice they really enjoy um, most for stirring martinis? I know I think for stirring one by ones are great. Um, I've also seen some people use these larger cubes. You have a question, Jessica? Yeah. Uh, no, I've just seen a lot of two by twos. I was going to just chat with you about it. Uh, just, I feel like the one by ones and the larger blocks are being used more often for stirring. Yeah, no, a thousand percent. And, you know, some of the reasons, the three elements that you have to really keep in mind is the surface area, the clarity and the temperature. Um, and the surface area is so important because it really impacts the rate of cooling and dilution. Um, you know, the surface area is different than volume. You, you have to be aware of that ratio also. You know, if you have greater surface area and less volume, that's when you tend to have ice that dilutes very quickly um, and releases water you know, at, at a more of a rapid rate. Um, and you really have to manage um, you know, that low surface area to volume ratio. That's why if you look at a sphere versus a cube, there's less surface area to a sphere than there is a cube, but there's also greater volume. So you're releasing the water at a slower rate but because the surface area um, and the, the impact of heat isn't as high, you're chilling um, while you're slowly releasing water. So that's super important. Um, yeah, two by twos are great for stirring the martini, a thousand percent. And then when you think about clarity, um, why that's important is it means that, you know, fewer and larger ice crystals um, when the, the freezing process happens, um, and that's important because that directly is going to impact the cooling rates and the dilution quality, depending upon the size of the ice crystals within the ice, the structure, the water itself, um, and how many. If they're smaller and there's a lot, you're going to quickly dilute. But if there's less and they're bigger to um, expand, um, you know, and, and create structural surface area, then they're going to cool um, at a rate that the dilution, uh, the, it dilutes slower than cooling, which is super important. Um, and then the perfect temperature, right? So uh, 
really the you want to be aware of that temperature and, and where the ice is when you're using it. And the freezing point from what I've learned is a good starting point, 30 degrees, 32, excuse me, degrees Fahrenheit. Um, is anything above this starts to melt. So if you have anything much below the freezing uh, point, then you're not going to be releasing water at the rate in which you need to, to, you know, efficiently serve a cocktail. But then if it's too high above the freezing point, then rapid dilution is going to happen. And then you're dealing with a, a watered down cocktail. So pulling ice and putting ice into um, your vessel, whether it's mixing glass, shaking tins, you know, glass to serve, whatever, uh, you really want to be aware of, of what your temperature is. Um, so that's that's really, you know, a, a critical point when you're thinking through these these freeze martini opportunities, like what ice type are you using? But what temperature is your ice type at? And then how are you using it? Are you stirring? Are you shaking? Are you building in glass? Are you serving it with ice, without ice? Um, so just kind of thinking through those. And then when you move forward, all about the Hoshi Cube, one by ones, baby. Um, and then when you move forward, so we're going to talk about Dave Arno a little bit. I know I can really get excited about this stuff. So I got to manage my time now. It looks like I have 12 minutes. Um but Dave Arnold talks about, you know, the, the matrix um, when you look at the start of chili and dilution. So when you're using, let's call it flat ice, hotel ice, um, you know, th but the, the flat, just standard ice well ice that has a lot of surface area, not a lot of volume, they dilute extremely quickly. But what's happening is the dilution and the temperature are growing at the same rate. So as the temperature right, or lowers, right, as you're chilling the drink, the dilution is following that path. So by the time you're at the right dilution or chilling point for your cocktail, your drink's going to be over diluted. Um, so if you move forward, please. In order to defy that, if you will, you know, it's, it's managing the ice type that allows you to increase temperature without over diluting, which comes down to surface area and volume, less surface area, more volume, right? So that's extremely important. So this is an example um, of, you know, uh, going back to kind of the cocktail serve. And it's a very easy, it's, it's a fairly standard martini, but what is important here that I kind of highlight is controlling the temperature of the ingredients before it goes into the mixing vessel, right? So freezing your vodka, keeping your vermouth cold in the fridge, which, you know, refrigerate your vermouth anyways, uh, mover and shakers uh, doing a great job sharing that with the world. Um, keeping, you know, this is interesting. And I understand that there are variables and uh, space restrictions behind the bar. Um, so I totally get that. But, you know, keeping your mixing glass in the freezer, um, of course, keeping your stem glassware in the freezer, but really controlling the temperature of each touch point of the cocktail, not just adding ice and stirring. Um, and this will really help you achieve, I think, that ideal temperature that we discussed. Um, and this is just a good method to kind of use. So now we're going to get into some of these freezing techniques. Um of how you can uh, utilize dilution and temperature in your cocktail. Um, so getting playful with the dilution. I know tea is super hot and a lot of people experience or utilize tea in all types of various ways. Um, but what, what I'm learning, and you could go ahead and go forward. Um, what I'm learning is I think a lot of people use teas by, you know, making syrups or doing infusions. Um, which is great, right? But what that's not doing is impacting dilution. So this is an example of a cocktail recipe um, that actually utilizes tea as the dilution source. Right? So we're using half an ounce of uh, cold brew. Again, cold, we're not doing, um, doing the normal brewing process utilizing heat. We're utilizing cold because if we're talking about cold, Everything needs to be cold, right? I think that's important to remember. Um, but utilizing a cold brew tea here, uh, we chose a sapphire jasmine needle tea um, as dilution 
method, right? And so this allows you to pre-batch this entire cocktail. And when you pre-batch this cocktail and store it, get it down to the right temp in the fridge, you know, or, or flash freeze it. Um, I do want to be careful because I've, I've made this mistake many times in learning that if you just keep this in the freezer, it's going to freeze right at the right ratio. So make sure that you're not batching this store in the freezer and forgetting about it. Um, you know, or, or you could freeze it and let it dilute or excuse me, thaw out. Um, but just make sure you're pulling in time for service where it's not frozen, but you can pre dilute this utilizing the half ounce of cold brew tea, batch it, boom, you're ready to serve. So you get the dilution that you're required, uh, that you're looking for. You get, you know, uh, impactful flavor and uniqueness and flavor. Um, and then you get to manage the temperature by keeping it in the refrigerator, keeping it in the freezer and pulling it in time um, to get it down to that temperature uh, for service. So this is one kind of technique to use. So the next technique we're going to talk about, um, and these are really some, you know, techniques leaning into the future. And you go ahead and move forward. Um, we're going to talk about suppression. We're going to talk about switching. And we're going to talk about fruit jacking. And fruit jacking really pull on the plate from the playbook of um, Applejack, you know, from the 1690s that we discussed. So I, I feel like, a, you know, a lot of us have probably learned or are familiar with utilizing a sous vide um, or, or heat where the vacuum extracts the flavor um, and, and really utilizes heat to extract the flavor. But suppression is using force, right? So... Think of sous vide as pulling flavor, right? And it's literally taking or extracting flavor from the fruit source, the herb source, whatever ingredient you're using, as suppression is pushing the flavor out and it's forcefully pushing the flavor out. Um, and, and how you're going to accomplish this is by using uh, a deep freezer. And again, I do understand that everybody has access to these, but I, I, I hope my goal is to not say, hey, you have to use these methodologies, but to help inspire ideas um, that allow you to get creative with methodology. So if you don't have a deep freezer, don't panic. There's certainly ways around it, right? But the idea is to utilize a single wall still growler, um, and then you're infusing these liquids in this growler in a deep freezer for about 24 hours, and you're allowing it to thaw over time. So it's very similar to the process we discussed, the freeze filtration with Elite. Right. You're getting it frozen. Um, the, the process we use because technology is a little quicker. Um, but this one, 24 hours in a deep freezer, allow it to thaw for four to six hours. And then you're straining the liquid out of it. And what that's done is it's pushed all of those flavors you're trying to blend and push them out of the ingredients into one place and, and really marry the liquids. Um, it's really bringing all those juices out um, and, and it helps just create a beautiful infused batch cocktail. And if you go to the next slide, you can see an example. And this is one where they literally, they go through the suppression process with all of the ingredients, right? So it's, it's a opportunity to pre-batch where they're taking the vodka, the sherry, um, the vermouth, and then grapes, throwing it into a growler put it in the deep freezer for 24 hours, pulling it out, letting it thaw, straining everything out. Um, and really at this point, I mean, there's no dilution. So you're going to have to ensure dilution, you know, by stirring the cocktail or your, your process of choice. Um, but all the ingredients are already built and batched and beautifully blended, which I find to be really unique. Um, the next process we're going to talk about is switching. Um, and this one's super fun. Um, so this is really what you're, you're going to do is, so you have to weigh the spirit, right? The raw spirit. How much does, what, what, what's the weight? How many grams is the spirit? Then you're freezing with a similar process to the suppression using a deep freezer. You're freezing the spirit um, and you have to make sure, you know, you're getting down to sub-zero temp. So really the idea temperature um, is going to be about negative 20 degrees Celsius or so, um, right around the same freezing point that we use for our freeze filtration process with Elite, which is negative 18 degrees. So that's deep freezer for 24 hours again, pulling it out. Um, 
but then the water from the spirit is going to naturally separate from the spirit itself. And so you're going to strain that water out, essentially leaving you with pure ethanol, right? You're almost reversing the distillation process. But now that you have that water pulled, you can then switch. And what that means is weighing that water, right? How much does that weigh? And replacing that weight with another liquid. So a, a clarified juice is a good example. Um, and where the technique gets super unique is understanding how to think recreate traditionally shaken cocktails or, or you know, more bright light refreshing cocktails utilizing um, citrus and, and different juice types. And putting that actual flavor, like a Cosmo, for example, the cranberry into the base spirit, where that cranberry juice is no longer needed. And what's really unique about this is it gives you the opportunity now to take traditionally shaken cocktails and actually start playing around with different methods like stirring the cocktail or building in glass and changing the mouthfeel and the viscosity of the cocktail um, and also potentially changing dilution rates of the cocktail as well. But you could take a Cosmo and instead of shaking it, you can now stir it with this technique. And if you go um, one slide forward, you're actually going to see a Cosmo example um, with switching. Uh, we did have a question on that from Darian wanting to know if removing if switching removes key congeners that would create that mouthfeel. Yeah. Um, to my understanding, Darian, it does not. Um, and I've personally played around with it and I can tell you that the mouthfeel, um, I, I've actually, I, I've experienced, you know, uh, it's more so than not enhanced mouthfeel, um, versus, you know, uh, thin mouthfeel. Um, I can't tell you scientifically if the congeners are, are gone or not. I can just tell you through application, um, in, you know, experience that I've had no issues with mouthfeel whatsoever. Nice. Um, and then the last example we're going to use is fruit jacking, um, and fruit jacking, is pulled um, from the same techniques and methodologies of Applejack. Uh, that, that's kind of where it comes from. Um, but the idea is rupturing the cell walls of the fruits by freezing them and then utilizing frozen fruit into infused spirits. And, and you know, this is one of those moments for me, especially when I was bartending, where when I started learning more about this, I go, ah, oh, that makes sense. Why didn't I think about that before? Right. Because you know, when you're using fresh fruit, I mean, there's this, uh, I guess, obvious idea of, oh, it's fresh. I want to utilize the best, most natural, fresh ingredients. Um, but, you know, the same idea of sous vide versus suppression, pulling flavor versus pushing flavor. Um, this is another example of what's going to happen is fruit jacking is going to push the flavor out, right? And, and so you think about when those cell walls are ruptured, um, and they start to, um, once they're in the spirit as a frozen fruit and temperature uh, increases, and then those cell walls start to rupture, you're pushing flavor out. So not only are you more quickly infusing the flavor of, of the ingredient into the spirit, but you're also enhancing the color, I think. Um, and you can have a lot of fun playing around with and managing color of, of um infused spirits and you know if you were to think about infusions from the point of colors you know kiwi for green watermelon for pink raspberry for red you know blueberry for blue purple whatever it is um i think you could have a lot of fun really changing colors of spirits as well um but this is you know and i also think i i think like a bar manager for things like this when it comes to cost control um efficiency quality management etc uh frozen fruit seems to be more accessible, uh, more affordable. Um, you don't have to worry about it going bad or, or rotting or waste behind the bar. Um, and so I think not only from a flavor impact perspective, um, I think it's a really unique uh, method to utilize in, in managing and controlling a bar program from the business perspective, um, which I think is important. Um, and I think, I, let's see, is there another slide? This is an example um, of utilizing fruit jacking. Um, so the frozen strawberry is, is what would have been used to push the flavor out um, into the Negroni to, to really create more impactful color and flavor. Um, but I believe 
That is it. And I think I'm literally right at an hour. So maybe a couple minutes. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I, uh, I, I'm i so used to having these conversations in person. So just hearing myself talk has been, uh, you know, uh, interesting. But I, I hope you gain something. Um, I know the team is going to share all of my information. Please reach out, social media, email me. Um, I, I owe a few of you uh, some answers to questions. And I hope we could connect so I could get those answers for you and, um, uh, you know, be, be an asset and, and resource for, uh, for whatever you need. So thank yeah. you all very, very much. And since this was the first out of a two-part series, stay tuned for the next one. And then if you did enjoy this class, please hit that like or love button. Show some love in the comments. You can always go back and watch this again if you just want to see Tyler's amazing face. Uh, you can also follow us on our Portland Cocktail Week Facebook group or the YouTube channel. And we are at PDXCW on Instagram. You can find out what's coming up next. It's going to be a lot of fun. And then last but not least, please submit your Elite Freeze Martini at PDXCW.com slash Elite Masters before July 31st. You might get the chance to go to Greece with a group of U.S. bartenders for the global finals. So Really looking forward to seeing what you guys come up with. Thank you, Tyler, so much for all your time and information. And then we will see y'all next time. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Really hope to see you in Athens. Uh, take care. <laughs>